sure we have that. Okay, so we've learned a little bit about conjugated and saturated systems. We've learned that um, we have resonance is helping us get different properties out of the system. We know we can move cations back and forth. We know we can move anions and we can even do radicals. However, we also know that we have a difference between our thermodynamic and our kinetic products. And we need to look at that as a, a way to predict our product ratio, okay? But in this last section here, section four, I wanna talk about a completely different type of reaction we haven't done before, and it's called the Diels-Alder reaction, okay? So in the Diels-Alder reaction, we have a new kind of reaction we haven't done before and we're calling it a four plus two cyclo addition, okay? So in this reaction, we have what we call a concerted reaction. Basically, we're gonna break and form bonds all at the same time, okay? So that's new, we haven't really done that before. And we call it a four plus two because we have four pi electrons that are in conjugation plus two other pi electrons that are gonna move around all at the same time to give us our new product, okay? So the key here is that it's a whole new system. However, it requires a conjugated diene to do it. And therefore we're introducing it here at this time, okay? <clears throat> so in this reaction, there's three features we have to really take in, into account here. We must have a 1,3 diene and it must be in the right configuration. We must have a second set of two pi electrons to play with. That can be either an alkene or an alkyne. And we're gonna call that second set of two electrons a dienophile. It's looking for the diene. The diene has the four electrons, the dienophile has the two electrons, and it's looking for that dienophile. <clears throat> okay. The third feature of a Diels-Alder reaction is that we always form a six-membered ring with a double bond in it, okay? So we always form a six-membered ring with a double bond in it. That six-membered ring can have two double bonds in certain cases, and I'll point that out to you. But we always form a six-membered ring with at least one double bond. And that double bond is always in between where the two diene double bonds were, okay? So we can follow which part of which doing our system on here. In fact, this is gonna be part of our um, <clears throat> uh, uh, exercise we're going to do on tomorrow is going to, we're going to do that exercise of looking at the deals alder reaction and some other uh, addition reactions on dienes and we're going to try to predict the products and we're going to try to predict the starting materials okay so in this conversion we're actually creating two new sigma bonds <clears throat> and we're losing two pi bonds Okay, so it's technically a release of energy in the system to drive the reaction forward, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and show you a couple different examples here. So one of the key features here is we start with a diene. And in this case here, I'm gonna, this is our simplest diene we learned about, and this is our diene, and notice it's in the S-cis configuration, okay? That'll become important. Just keep in mind, okay? So this is our four electrons and our four plus two, okay? And then the other side of this, this is our dienophile, okay? Our dienophiles typically have some kind of electronic drawing group like a carbonyl or something like that on there. So we actually see that this feature right here is pretty common to see in a dienophile, and I'll explain why, okay? So we have our four electrons here, we have our two electrons right here, and whenever we do that, we, in fact, let me change the color of these electrons over here to blue. So we have these electrons right here, these double bond electrons right here. We have these double bond electrons and these double bond electrons, okay? So when we run this reaction, we do it all at the same time and the pi electrons are the ones that move. Okay, so these pi electrons are going to come up here and create our new sigma bond here. Okay, and these pi electrons are gonna flip down here and these pi electrons are gonna form our new sigma bond over here. Okay, 
So, and when that happens, our last set of electrons are gonna form our double bond in our six metal ring, okay? <clears throat> so this is the basics of that reaction. Now, once we've run that reaction, right, we still have two double bonds, right? So in theory, we could run another Diels alder on this product that we just formed here by adding another diene, okay? Now, what you'll notice is the product of the second step of the reaction, it only reacted on one side. And we'll have a reason for that. Because in this case here, this dienophile does not have the carbonyl functionality on it. This carbony, this uh, dienophile does have these on there. So it's specifically gonna react on that one side to give us just this one product of a dye substituted compound here, okay? So key feature is we formed a six membered ring. It still has a double bond in it and the dienophile probably is gonna have an electronic drawing group on it, okay? So these are things to look for as we move forward, okay? So let's take a look at a different diene right here. And this diene right here just has these two methyl groups here. So those methyl groups are gonna be found on that ring we're forming. We know that because this is our diene, we're gonna end up with a double bond in between those two methyl groups because that's where that, those double bond electrons are gonna go. Now let's look at our dienophile. Our dienophile has a triple bond, okay? Which means we have one set of pi electrons in one direction and the other set of pi electrons orthogonal to that, right? So we just have two pi clouds that are opposite each other. Only one of those pi clouds is gonna react in that reaction, meaning we still have the other pi bond. So if you end up with a hexadiene, then you probably started with something in a triple bond in your dienophile, okay? Also, notice the feature here is that your dienophile has a carbonyl on here. This is an ester functionality here. So you have a carbonyl, and so you have this electronic drawing group on your dienophile. It's gonna reach out, and these electrons are gonna reach out here and grab, make a, double, a single bond here. These electrons are gonna reach out and make a single bond here. These electrons are gonna move here. We're still gonna have a one leftover pi bond here, and this pi bond has moved. And look at our product right here. We formed our six-membered ring. We still have our second pi bond here, and our pi bond moved to the opposite direction, uh, moved to in between the two substituted groups. So that's another feature we will see a lot of in our Diels Alder reaction. Okay. So question. Yes. Uh, for that one, if we were to use another um, diene, would it attack the side with that uh, C, uh, O2CH group? If we had another diene in there, yes, it would attack the one with the CO. Because this one is, uh, we're going to find out, has these electron donating groups on there. This electronic drawing group, the carbonyl group, is going to help the reaction go faster. So yes, if we added another diene, it would attack this side of the compound. I had a question as well. Yes. Um, I noticed that whenever you've been saying the, the double bonds move, they, they always kind of rotate like counterclockwise, like this one went here and this one goes here. Uh -huh. uh, is, is that a safe rule of thumb just to, to uh, assume? They, they all move over one position. It can be clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter. They just have to all move in the same direction. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So you know, those are really good questions, by the way. Okay. So now in this last example, it looks really complicated because we're ending up with a three ring system, okay? But the same reaction is happening here. It just looks a little more confused. And I've actually drawn this such that the colors of the carbons stay the same. I hope you can see the difference between the red carbons and the blue carbons here. So in this case, we have our diene. And notice it's locked in that S cis configuration, okay? Whenever we're locked in that S cis configuration, it actually helps the reaction go, okay? And because it's in that ring and it's forced to be in that S cis, okay? Now, on our <clears throat> other compound right here, this is malic and hydride. Uh, it has a double bond here and then it has two electronic drawing groups on it. 
making it a really good dienophile. So it has two electron drawing groups on it, making it a really good dienophile. But the same thing's gonna happen here. We're gonna have the electrons from this double bond reach out and grab the carbon on the first part of the di dienophile. The electrons from the dienophile are gonna reach out and grab the position where the other end of the diene was. And those electrons that were in that diene are gonna move down to be in between where the two double bonds were, okay? So if we look at our product here, this right here is this, play, this part of this compound right here. Notice the red electrons here are the ones that reached out and grabbed that part of the bond. And the dienophile blue electrons are on this part here, okay? So it's important, you, went, went, you have to do this a couple times to where you're seeing where the electrons go, okay? So these electrons are ending up here, these electrons are ending up as our double bond, and the dienophile electrons make that new sigma bond. Notice, no other bonds broke or were made. All we made was those two sigma bonds and that double bond moved, okay? So it doesn't matter what the rest of the substrate is, just keep them in place and you'll be able to predict the products and predict the reactants of this reaction, okay? So let's go on and talk a little bit about some of the rules. We have about four rules associated with the diels alder reaction, okay? The first rule I kind of alluded to in the fact that it has to be in that S cis configuration, okay? Because we're moving all the electrons all at the same time, it's a concerted reaction, they have to be ready, okay? So that means the diene has to be in the S cis configuration before it will react, okay? So luckily, when we have our conjugated dienes, we have a sigma bond, wait, hold on, let me, uh, there, all right. We have a sigma bond in between those two double bonds, that sigma bond still has rotation. So we can rotate that bond. We haven't changed the double bonds at all. All we've done is rotate them around, okay? Once we get into this uh, S cis trans, uh, S cis configuration, we can now are ready to do the reaction, okay? Now, if you have something like with really big groups here to where it doesn't want to be in that S cis configuration, that will inhibit the reaction, okay? But as I kind of hinted at before, if you force it to be in that S cis configuration, it actually makes it more reactive, okay? There's no, it doesn't have to wait around for the rotation. It doesn't have two different options it can be on. It's forced to be in that S cis configuration and therefore it's going to react faster, okay? And just like that, if it is forced to be in the S trans configuration, it won't react at all. So in this case here, we have a two ring system where there, these double bonds are in conjugation. It's still a one, three diene, but there's no way for it to rotate around. There's no way for it to get to that S cis configuration. Therefore, it will not react, okay? So the first rule is you must be in an S cis configuration. And if you're forced in that S cis configuration, you're even more reactive, okay? All right, the second rule I alluded to as well is that electron withdrawing groups on the dienophile increase the reaction rate, okay? And this has everything to do with the idea that our diene is acting as the nucleophile. It's seeking positive charge. And our dienophile is seeking negative charge. So if you can pull some of the electron density away from that double bond, you are making it a better target for your nucleophile. You're making it more electropositive. Your nucleophile is more attracted to it, okay? So any electron withdrawing group will work. And many of the things are things like aldehydes, ketones, esters, right here. But you can also have acid chlorides, nitro groups, cyano groups. Uh, anything with some kind of electron withdrawing group will work, okay? Now, uh, alkenes without these electron withdrawing groups can work as dienophiles, 
but it usually is slow and takes a lot of heat to do them. So what we'll see in most of our reactions is things that have these carbonyl groups on it or nitro groups on it or cyano groups on it. Those are gonna be most commonly found in our systems. And if you have two of them on here, if they're kind of tied back in a bow, like in a circle, that makes them even more reactive. So our benzoquinone here and our malic anhydride are really, really positive. It doesn't have to be, but it really helps the reaction. Okay, so the second rule is electron drawing substituents on the dienophile, the dienophile increase the reaction rate. Okay, so our third rule is that if electronic drawing groups on the dienophile help, then that means electron donating groups on the diene also help. Okay, so if we can substitute our diene with either a um, an alkoxy group or an alkyl group, that will make it react even faster, okay? So in this example here, I have methyl groups on the uh, th two and three positions of this uh, butadiene. That enhances the rate so much that we can actually do this almost at room temperature with the locating of just a small electronic drawing group on the dienophile, okay? So butadiene is reactive enough to do it by itself, However, anytime you add a donating group to it, it is going to increase the reaction rate, okay? So, and then our fourth rule is whatever the stereochemistry or whatever the ring structures were on the dienophile, they stay there, okay? So, <clears throat> let's take, for example, we have two different forms of the same material here. We have maleic acid, which is where we have these two carboxylic acids that are cis to each other. And remember that double bond does not have free rotation, so this is a unique compound compared to the ones where they're trans to each other. When they're trans to each other, they're called fumaric acid, okay? So these are just two different carboxylic acids with two different structures because we don't have free rotation around that double bond. Okay, so <clears throat> if the, uh, two groups on our double bond are cis to each other in the starting material, they are going to stay cis to each other in the product, okay? So let's say we have this dienophile come in and attack and it attacks from, let's say the top side, that means those two double bonds are gonna go down and that gives us this product here. Let's say instead we slip that, that diene underneath that fumaric acid and attack from the bottom side, that's gonna flip those two, uh, out, those two uh, carboxylic acids up, okay? <clears throat> so notice they're on the same side. The product, we did not change the stereochemistry of our dienophile, okay? Now, let's look at the other one. If we look at the trans uh, derivative, the fumaric acid, and we come in with our um, dienophile and we come in from the bottom of this fumaric acid, and we're taking that and coming from the bottom of that fumaric acid, that means one of these is gonna be flipped up <clears throat> and one has to be flipped down. And so we get the one up and one down. They're still trans to each other, <coughs> okay? And if it went and uh, reacted the opposite direction, we would still have the groups trans to each other. So start with a cis, cis material, you end with a cis material. Start with a trans material, you end with a trans material. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the fourth rule of diels alder reactions. Okay, the fifth rule of diels alder reactions is what we call endo-orientation. Okay, now this is gonna take some visualization. Okay, so if we have a substituent on our dienophile, Okay, it's gonna order itself in a way such that the substituent is usually an electronic drawing group, and therefore it's going to try to be in as close to the diene as possible before it reacts, okay? So when we look at the product given here, let's look specifically at the group that was on the dienophile right here. Okay, so if this group on the dienophile winds up 
closest to the double bond, it is what we call the endo configuration. See how its proximity to this double bond is? That's endo. Now it says here oriented cis to the longest or more unsaturated bridge. That that's definition is correct. Um, but I like to say that the endo is the Z is closest to the double bond. Now look how far away this Z is to the other double bond. It has to literally go over or further away to get to this double bond. So that is technically uh, exo, and that is trans to the longest unsaturated bridge, but I like to say that the Z is farther away from the double bond. Okay, so endo is where whatever group was on your dienophile is closest to your final double bond. Exo is where whatever your Z on your dienophile was is farthest away from your double bond in your final product. Okay, so endo is always favored, okay? But why? Okay, so <clears throat> it all has to do with the transition state. Because this happens all at the same time, we actually have to have the two molecules sitting right next to each other, so the only thing that moves is electrons. And it goes click and closes up to make its ring, right? So that means that the two molecules need to be close together or somehow ordered correctly to get the electrons to just go, oh, here we go, click, and done, okay? So that's why I like to think of a concerted, act, uh, a concerted reaction. You get them close together and then they go, and then they just reach out and grab each other and then, then it's done, the reaction's done, okay? So, if we take an example where we form the product where we have endo, that means that this group right here is going to have to be somehow tucked under here so it's closest to there, okay? So the product here is, this was our, our electron drawing group and it's closest to here, that's endo. It seems like that's kind of wrong because sterically you might think it would want it to be out like in a cyclohexane where you want it to be in the in the equatorial position, right? That's not how it works in the diels alder reaction. We always want to tuck that electron and drawing group under, okay? So if we look at how we did this, if we were to come in and, and attack with this diene on this dienophile, again, we're gonna find out these electron drawing groups are gonna be on the closest side to this double bond to give us our endo, okay? And it all comes down to how they order in space before they do that final reaction, okay? So if we look at it from the perspective of one is coming in from one side and one's coming in from the other side and they're lining up to so that all they have to do is move electrons, what we wanna do is we wanna have the electron withdrawing group, which is partially positive, right? And it's gonna be attracted electrostatically to the diene, uh, the double bond of the diene, the diene, because it's partially negative. So they're gonna electrostatically line up in that position. And when they get close enough together, the electrons say, hey, well, reach out and grab and turn into that cyclohexane ring. So because it's tucked under like that, and because they're in, attracted to each other electrostatically, they can preform this uh, transition state to where when they click together, your electronic drawing group is in the endo position, okay? Let's look at it from the other perspective. Let's say that our electronic drawing group is not attracted to our dienophile, our diene. So we have our diene here and our electronic drawing group is sitting way over here, uh, uh, facing out from it, it's not attracted to this at all. So it will still come in and still react. However, it would have electrostatically wanted to kind of try to be attracted to the negative side here and form the endo instead. But if it does form, it's not easy, it's not as attracted to it electrostatically, and so it will form the exo product but the endo product is preferred because of that electrostatic interaction between the electron drawing group and the double bond. Okay, so let's answer any questions about endo and exo first. Okay. Any questions about endo and exo?
So um, in a lot of the examples we have in the book, we use the cyclopentadiene uh, and it'll make these bicyclosystems. But there are several examples in the book where we only form the cyclohexane. And for some people, it's easier to look at the cyclohexene that's formed from just the diene and the dinophile as opposed to the multi-ring systems. So double check the book, make sure you can see where the double bond, the, the, the diene is coming in and that the dienophile is lining up such that the electronic drawing group is tucked under there before it reacts. That's gonna show you why endo is favored and that's gonna show you how to predict the product. You gonna be okay by yourself in that house? Of course, are you yeah. kidding? I'm Oops. Let's mute all for a second. Here we go. Okay, continue. All right. Okay. So that being said, is there still specificity? Can we, if we have unsymmetrical things, can we still predict uh, product ratios? And the question, and, and the answer is yes. Okay. So let's say you have an unsymmetrical diene and an unsymmetrical diene file. Okay. Can you predict which way it's going to go? <clears throat> and we use the same argument for that prediction based on the why the endo and exo work. You want to have an electrostatic attraction between a donator and a, uh, a electronic drawing group happen before you do the concerted reaction, okay? So in the case of this compound here, we have a diene right here, and we have an electron donating group, a methoxy group at the end. And then we have a nice small dienophile here with just an aldehyde on it, the uh, uh, propionyl right here. And based on that electrostatic attraction to each other before they react, we can say that the two, the electron donating group is going to be closer to the electron drawing group in the major product. Okay. So it all has to do with the idea that we have our, um, Actually, this should be the electro-negative side. This is an electro-positive side. This is the electro-positive side. And that's the electro-negative. Oh, no, it was right the first time, sorry. Okay, so if you look at our resonance contributors here, we'll see that this partially negative side of the diene is attracted to the partially positive side of the extended conjugation of the dienophile. This partially positive section of the uh, the oxygen, because remember it's it's partially positive because it's donating part of its electron density to the conjugated system, is attracted to the partially negative end of the carbonyl. So this is being electrostatically attracted to this. This is being electrostatically attracted to that, driving the major product to be with two groups, forming a bond next to each other. Okay, so even in unsymmetrical reagents, we can predict that the two things are going to be electrostatically attracted to each other first, and then they're going to do the concerted reaction in the end. <clears throat> All right, questions about the Diels Alder reaction, the different rules associated with the Diels Alder reaction, and the endo exo. Okay, it really helps to go ahead and try this, draw this out on paper a couple times. Once you get it, you get it. It's just, you have to think about how it, how the two things are aligning before they react. If you can get that straight in your head, then it will be easy to predict the products and the reactants of these materials. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing right here. So we're at 120. Our exam starts at 130. So <clears throat> our mock exam, sorry, don't scare anybody. Uh, our mock exam starts at 130. Uh, it's ready and scheduled right now. So I'm open to answer any questions right now. Because we've gotten all the way through chapter 13, we will have time for a review uh, tomorrow before the activity. Okay, again, the activity will be with Diels Alder reactions and uh, conjugate addition, I mean, uh, uh, one, four, and one, three additions. So um, if you have questions uh, before that, go ahead and email them to me. I'll make sure to include them in my review uh, on Thursday 
morning, I mean, the, thir the Thursday first session before our breakout sessions in the afternoon. Okay. Will we get um, scratch paper on when we take the test or will we be allowed it? Okay, that's a great question. Let's talk about the actual test itself. So uh, I have, I, I will send out a, uh, a, a meeting reminder about that. And it's going to say the same thing where, you know, it's at noon, it, Top Hat suggests you reboot your computer to clear out all your memory, open just Chrome and uh, Proctorio. You're going to want to show your ID. Sometimes it doesn't like your ID if you're wearing glasses on your ID and you're not wearing glasses or the other way around. So keep in mind that you want to look a little bit more like your ID. You're going to show blank sheets of paper. You do get to use blank sheets of paper to, to write on. And then um, what it'll do is you'll start the exam. You'll, you'll be able to write stuff down and, and answer questions and write stuff down and answer questions. And then after you, you know, uh, save each question and answer each question and submit, it'll give me a report saying that you had um, uh, unusual behavior, like you were talking off camera to someone or somebody was passing your notes or people were behind you and talking to you. Those are the things that'll pop up on it as suspicious behavior, and those get reviewed. And if it's you know something innocent, that's not not a problem. If it's something flagrant violation of our ethics code, then we'll have to you know, have a talk. Uh, yes, you do have to have a webcam to do our exams. Uh, if you don't currently have a webcam, we I do have an option for that. And go ahead and email me. Uh, but as we move forward with any kind of online testing, we will uh, need to either have access to a webcam or a um, uh, or borrow a computer for the exam day so that it does have a webcam. Uh, for example, I'm doing this on a Mac here, which has, it's, it's great for this, but it doesn't have a lot of processor power. So if I have to do a lot of processing and have an artificial background, I, I borrow my daughter's uh, gaming laptop because it's a lot more powerful. Um, I have a question the thing about using a web uh, school ID school ID or a driver's license either one will work uh, are you allowed to use modeling kits on the exams um, yes I will allow that <clears throat> you know as long as you're trying to you know use them kind of in front of the camera and not like doing something down here you know if you if you're modeling in front of the camera that is allowed Are online modeling kits allowed? Online modeling kits, no. You cannot uh, navigate away from your screen. You cannot take a screenshot. You cannot uh, record it. Those are things that the uh, it'll it'll immediately lock you out for. So uh, you can use physical modeling kits. You can draw on paper. You can draw on. on <clears throat> um, I think you try to log into the mock exam with what you have. If it doesn't allow you to do it, then let's go ahead and uh, uh, figure out a way. I Again, email me and we have a backup way to do this. And so we can, okay, uh, let's see. Do we have uh, 24 hours for a normal test? No, we do not. We actually have uh, an hour and 40 minutes for our exam. It starts at noon and ends at 1.40, unless you have an ODS, um, uh, extension time where we have a, I have a different exam set aside for those people uh, so that they have a different time limit. Uh, the exams are not visible until the actual exam time happens so we won't actually see uh, the mock exam until uh, 1.30. It actually will not even become available to you. <clears throat> yes, you can use a, uh, a dry erase board uh, again, as long as it's somewhere that, like if you're drawing it so that we can see that you're using the dry erase board, that should be perfectly acceptable. <clears throat> but uh, for a lot of people, it's easier to use scratch paper right in front of you. Okay. It works best to have it like right in front of you so you're not looking off screen or it'll tag you, but we, we, can, we can work those through those details as needed. <clears throat> so but try to get into the mock exam using your webcam if you have one. Uh, if not, I have what we call, just email me and we have uh, what we call a backup exam. Uh, but 
by the end of the semester, all of our exams must be taken online with a web camera, including the final. So we'll need to move forward with our technology to get us all on the same page. <coughs> okay. So let me go ahead and stop recording.